Today's lecture in the IDE course is about product language. So basically we'll be talking about an introduction to the theory of industrial design. And that means the theory of everything design that is not engineering design. And typically for engineers, this comes as quite a confusing shock, what we will be talking about. So to start the uh, discussion, or let's say the exploration of this topic, I'll, I'll start with something that we can all easily relate to, which is uh, just the image of four different um, lightweight motorbikes that are typically seen uh, on the streets of Bangkok and of course everywhere in the world too. And the quiz, question is how are they different and why are they different? Why are they actually available and why are they actually sold to different people? Now we can assume that all of these bikes cost almost the same money. They do not. There are still some price differences. They have the same technical specifications, similar power, similar maximum speed. Um, and there could be all the other features and functions would be similar to with regards to driving, comfort, and so on. But still, they're very different. Uh, and people decide differently. Uh, and it's not only based on price, although there are some small price differences, but um, people will typically not decide based on price, but uh, on some sort of emotional taste uh, consideration. Uh, based on that. So uh, if we would sit in the same room, that is always an interesting game. I, I let people choose uh, which one of these four they would choose. And it's interesting that we we just have different groups of people. We have uh, the group of people that would uh, choose uh, the Cubics uh, or the, the one on the bottom left that looks very classical designed, very much like the original Italian design um, of Piaggio or uh, Lambretta. And then we have quite a big group that chooses the more aggressive looking uh, design on the top. And then we'll always have a group of people that, that would choose the bottom right, which uh, looks more like a traditional motorbike with, which appears to be, uh, which appears to have a more visible, more traditional frame, right? And then, uh, then we, we could uh, uh, play interesting games. I would, I would predict what kind of music the people like based on their choice of motorbike, what kind of uh, clothing the people like and, and uh, prefer to choose and so on. Uh, because really the, uh, the different designs of these bikes, they appeal to uh, the lifestyle of people, the self-awareness of people, how they see themselves and, and what values they have, what they think is important and meaningful and what they think is not important and meaningful. Uh, maybe the uh, uh, some some interesting or, or nice, easy to understand example is um, uh, some people feel it is important that the uh, that the motorbike looks fast and strong, and other people don't think that's important. For other people, it's it's uh, more important that the motorbike has a feeling of uh, maybe a more relaxed lifestyle. And they're happy if it kind of looks like something old, something traditional or classic. Uh, so a, a similar example is uh, may, maybe this one uh, is something that that uh, kind of shocked me almost a few years ago. Now these were brand new models one or two years ago. I always forget the name of that brand, but it's uh, I think it's uh, owned by uh, it's it's a it's a British brand, but they produce these things in India. They're very popular in Thailand. Why do I always forget the brand name? Uh, anyhow, uh, so they, they obviously uh, try to look as closely as possible as the or original Italian designs from the 1950s, uh, but they have uh, more, more power, more engine power, 200 cubic centimeters. They, they look kind of, they're a bit longer. So they look like uh, customized uh, vintage bikes. And uh, here in Thailand, there's a huge market for that. Uh, so how can these be new models? Why don't they look new? Why do they have to look old? Why are people interested in buying something new that looks old? And then here's the final example, still motorbikes. Uh, it's, you could say this is the opposite of the first slide, because here we have four bikes that look really similar. 
uh, that that feel really similar all of them i would say appeal similarly to the people who like them that means there will be a lot of people who don't like any of these bikes but then the people who will like any of these four bikes will like all of these four bikes maybe not equally uh, still uh, people will be able to choose which of the four they think is most attractive um, but technically and especially economically they're completely different so the, these four bikes appeal to a similar lifestyle um, and uh, share different aesthetics you could say you could say that they are kind of retro or classic uh, but also um, more performance oriented than let's say the vespas uh, or piaggios um, but they come with completely different price tags so maybe uh right surely the most uh, expensive one is on the top right that's a bmw and i think here in thailand you have to expect to pay uh, at least 1.3 million baht for this one uh, might go up to 1.7 i'm not sure at the moment i haven't look, looked at the numbers for for quite some time and the extreme opposite is right under that bmw bottom right that would be a gpx gentleman and uh, they they are keeping updated every year, so that's probably not the most recent model. But this one will be order of magnitude uh, seventy to eighty thousand baht, right? So you can easily buy fifteen of these for the price of one of the BMWs. And then uh, like mid range is uh, or upper mid range is the Kawasaki. Of course, they come with different powers and engines, very differently, but still the style is similar. Um, so I think the Kawasaki is maybe around 800,000. And then bottom left, that will be the Honda Rebel, uh, available as 300 and 500 cubic centimeters. And that's between 160,000 for the 300 cubic centimeters and 250,000 for the 500 cubic centimeters. So extremely differently with regards to technical specifications and price point. Uh, but the, the style, and the taste that is addressed is very similar. So the big question is, uh, as engineers, we we try to to rationalize everything, uh, at least when when we believe that we have to act as engineers, we we always come up with some sort of rational explanation, either technical or econom economical, to justify a decision, and we should do that. Uh, last semester we. We discussed in MDP, we discussed uh, formal uh, processes or, or methods to uh, arrive at a decision based on uh, a balanced consideration of, of many rational requirements and their fulfillment. But then as private people, we don't do that. We, as private people, we see something and either it leaves us cold, either it's completely uninteresting or we feel oh my god i want to have this thing and then we often spend more money than we should than we can justify to get something that rationally we don't really need or we could have a much much cheaper version of the same thing that fulfills the same technical function but but we want to have it anyway and the big question is why is that the case um, so some people don't do that at all some people really are super rational in all aspects of their life um, but most people have uh, that 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 sort of thing in themselves where they uh, react to objects uh, in an emotional way where i just realize oh my god i want to have it uh, and uh, this of course depends on uh, also depends on if you have the means uh, in other words money to uh, to do such purchases um, so this happens on different levels, of course, but it still happens. Uh, the question is why? So uh, that's obviously an issue of psychology and uh, people have thought about that for long times. And uh, an established model in psychology, which, which many of us have already maybe seen in school, and it's, it's often quoted, is, uh, is a model of Maslow. It's called the hierarchy of needs. And basically uh, Maslow says, well, people's actions are motivated by needs. So we need to understand how needs work. And interestingly enough, uh, there are different kinds of needs 
and that they're not active at the same time, but there's a hierarchy, which means uh, a level or a kind of need is only activated if the more fundamental need is uh, satisfied. And so, so basically he distinguishes five levels of needs uh, and uh, he shows them as a pyramid because uh, what is expressed here is that the lower levels are more fundamental, more important, and they become active first. And only if they are satisfied, then uh, the next level of needs becomes active, which means uh, you don't feel a need unless the lower level of need is satisfied. So obviously the lowest and most fundamental level will be physiological needs. That includes the need to eat and drink and sleep and, and move your body. Uh, and you can generally say that uh, if, if, if these needs are active, nothing else uh, is important. And uh, you need to satisfy these needs. If you do not satisfy these needs, your body will get sick or your mind will get sick. Um, and so they're called deficiency needs. Now, so the next level would be safety. So generally the idea is that you're not worried about safety if you're very hungry or thirsty or you desperately need sleep, right? So your need for safety is, but it's still very fundamental. It's the second thing that becomes important to any human being as long as the physiological needs are satisfied. So that means, uh, for example, you start worrying about Okay, I've just eaten and and had and had a water to drink. What about tomorrow? Uh, how can I make sure that that I'll be able to satisfy these needs tomorrow? Or uh, what about all these other predators out there trying to eat me? Right. This is again, this is not important at, uh, while you're desperately hungry, but but all these uh, safety considerations become uh, uh, important after that. Now, uh, these two basic uh, levels are both deficiency needs, where typically you say uh, that uh, if, you, if you don't um, satisfy these needs, um, there will be some sort of malfunction like uh, health problems. Um, and the next levels, you, you could consider them more luxurious levels of needs, but, and, and often they're, they're being put down as luxury, but really they're not because they're, they're programmed in our psyche. So uh, it, is, it is also necessary to, to be aware of these needs, to address these needs. And you could also say if these needs are not uh, satisfied, then you will get sick. Uh, although it's not your body that will get sick, but really your mind. So the next level is uh, called love and socialization here, uh, which means that if you have uh, sufficiently uh, uh, pleased your needs, uh, your physiological and needs for safety, suddenly you become aware of that you want to have uh, social interactions um, um, on the different forms of social act interactions that exist. You, you want to have some sort of community contact with other people and you want to have relationships with other people. And if you are sufficiently satisfied, and I, and I do say sufficiently satisfied, then suddenly you realize you have a need of esteem that within your social network, within the group of people that you interact with, uh, you want to be recognized as some person of value, of, of esteem, so to speak. And then finally, if you feel, yeah, you, you do have this esteem, you are recognized uh, as a valuable person, then the, the last uh, or highest level of needs will become active, which is the need for self-actualization. And this is, for example, which, which makes people um, follow, uh, let's say, for example, sports that, that go beyond uh, just fulfilling physiological needs or safety needs because you don't want to get fat and sick, for example. Or it might be arts. Maybe you start, uh, um, you start becoming an artist by writing poetry or books or even blogging, for example, right? You might suddenly feel the need you want to share uh, you want to share your activities and not only because you want to have more self, more esteem, you want to get recognized by other people, but uh, simply because you feel you want to express that, right? Um, like playing music or uh, developing uh, an, uh, a more specific taste in music or arts or whatever. Um, 
So before I said uh, to satisfy your need for a social network sufficiently, this is because typically psychologists say that the upper three levels, they cannot be fully satisfied. Uh, that um, which is different from the, the lower two levels, physiological and safety needs. Typically, uh, you can satisfy these fully, at least for the time being, which means you're hungry, you eat, you're full, you're not hungry anymore, right? But uh, the, the upper three levels is typically people never get enough uh, socialization. You can't say, okay, now I've, I've had it, right? Now I have exactly enough love and, and, uh, and, and, and friends I don't need anymore at the moment. And same goes to self-esteem, self-actualization. So these are what, what is called growth needs. Uh, you can't satisfy them. You want more and more and more. Now let's go back to product design and, and selling things. This is interesting. Like if you're, if you're selling food, you can only sell so much food, right? Because people will be full, they don't buy more. But if you're selling stuff that addresses the three top level uh, of needs, that means you, you can basically just keep on selling like crazy. Uh, let's say uh, a favorite example is, is watches. Why do people spend a lot of money on expensive brand watches? There is no rational reason for that because they can get very good quality watches like Casio or something, which gives the time perfectly well and it has good quality, so it will stay for many years without breaking. And they're much cheaper. So why do people buy Rolex or Breitling or whatever? And, you, well, you can say, well, this has to do with either esteem or self-actualization, right? People just, they either want to use the watch to show that they've made it, right? To send signals to the people around them to gain esteem. Or they just love these things. They just love whatever comes with these objects. They, they love to own them uh, because it kind of gives them some sort of nice feeling about owning these things, about being able to look at them and so on and so on. So the, uh, so I can't clearly say uh, a Rolex watch uh, addresses the need for esteem uh, because it could be a self-actualization, right? Um, but then some people, they just, they don't really have an emotional connection to expensive watches like, like some uh, like a lot of collectors have. They, they really have, they really love these things, but they say, well, I think I have to buy this watch because uh, people will look at me in a different way if I have one. And they, and they don't really care about the watch. They just care about what they believe uh, they will gain in esteem. So that's obviously a, a very complicated topic. I've, I've tried to name some examples that, that everybody uh, can understand. And some of my examples are probably uh, scientifically not, not super correct, but I hope I'm making the point. If you're really interested in that, you want to understand more, uh, then you really have to study more about psychology. There's a lot of, now this is established. This is not a brand new model. As I said, probably you've, uh, you've heard about it in school, maybe. Now, um, this little graphic I just uh, put in on the top, this is uh, my contribution or my, my consideration of that, which I men mentioned before is basically you can say there are two different kind of needs. So the question is, when do people buy stuff? And uh, both are, uh, well, people would say, well, I have a problem. I need to solve the problem, so I need to buy something. Um, but that's certainly applicable to the two lower level of needs. So let's say the problem is uh, I, I, I need to cut the piece of meat so I can eat it, right? Uh, that's definitely a problem. And uh, this is something that you can deal with rationally. So you can rationalize the problem. You can uh you 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 are aware of the problem and then you can look at different options to help you uh to consider to help you cut that piece of meat right the same same thing is is true for industrial goods right if you have uh a factory and you produce stuff then you know well i have this problem i need to have these holes uh so i need a tool that can make these holes right um so you can you can look at different machines that are available or different technologies and choose the best one. So it's deliberate search, deliberate research. It uh, is uh, a, a process that you are aware of that you can rationalize. And then you can uh, identify a so-called cure, which is a solution to the problem. And if you have the currency, the money to, to, so to buy that, then you have solved the problem. You, uh, so I call it demand here. Demand means 
um, uh, is, is, is only really uh, exists if you can also, if that, that option is available to you because you have the money, right? Uh, now, if you talk about the, the higher levels of needs, you don't really call that a problem, right? If you, if you, feel, if you feel lonely, if you kind of feel you, you want to have social contact, you wouldn't call that a problem. It's like, well, I have a problem, I feel lonely. It's, it's, problem is the wrong word, right? So it's an unsatisfied need. And, and typically, uh, all these three top levels of needs here, you, you're not even aware of them, right? You, people, if they have a need for love or socialization, maybe yes, maybe you, you can be rationally aware of that, but especially with the next two levels, esteem and self-actualization, you're not really aware of that. You, you kind of feel unhappy, right? Unsatisfied that something is wrong, that you, you're just not totally relaxed and happy. This means you have needs that need to be attended. But you, for the love of God, you don't know what to do to cure your need for esteem if it's, if it's there, right? Uh, probably you're not even aware that you have a need for esteem. And you're certainly not aware of how you, you could deal with that. What is the best, uh, the best solution to your problem of, of, of lacking self-esteem? That doesn't happen in your brain. That happens in your heart, right? So how do you f identify a solution to that? Well, this is what the little graphic says here. What, what, what I claim is you don't do that by a deliberate search, a deliberate consideration, but, but by accident which means this is how shopping works. You walk around, you see something, and you want to have it. And now this is the, uh, the answer to the question I've asked before, uh, is basically when you, when you get confronted with something, your, your thinking machine or your heart or whatever mechanism, very complex evaluation mechanism will tell you, oh, wow, uh, I want to have this watch. Uh, maybe because, and, and this is, your brain doesn't know about it, but your heart knows about it. Maybe because you feel with this watch, uh, you can self-express your personality better, right? Or maybe because you feel, wow, people will turn around and look at me, will look at me in a different way if I wear this watch, right? Uh, so, so this is basically what I'm saying here is that uh, the, the mechanisms of arriving at a decision to buy something, so what, what creates a demand they are different depending on of what kind of needs we have. And you could further say that the gray part, the unsolved problem, the deliberate search, this is what engineers deal with. And they're used, they're trained all their life to deal with these fundamental needs which are rational, which are deliberate, which you are aware of, and how to address them. And the whole design methodology, engineering design methodology that we discussed in the courses before, they address basically these sort of uh, needs or problems. And design, and when I say design, uh, we have the amb ambiguity of the, of the word that it's not clearly defined. I mean, all the design that deals with aesthetics and emotions and style, uh, they are really the experts of dealing with, with these higher needs. And, and they're the experts of identifying the features and aesthetics and style of the product to design them in the way that people will recognize them as what they're intended to do, which is to satisfy these complex needs. Now, this is basically the job description of design. And, and we, uh, it usually takes some sensitivity on behalf of the person that, that wants to be a professional in that, in that job. And of course, it takes a lot of study. And designers typically get better while they get more experience. And it's not about the technique or skill, but it's more basically understanding people, right? Uh, understanding the needs of people and style. And then, uh, and of course, also trends and everything that ha happens in culture around the people. So the big question is, what, what are we really talking about? Apart from needs, what, what are, so to speak, what are the... the the, the product features. What are the features on the product? What are the parameters of a product that address this stuff? Right? That, that question has been 
has been bothering uh, mankind since the industrial revolution is what is what are designers really good at what what do they really work on what are the 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 product properties that these designers work on and it has taken until the 1970s until people came up with with an answer to that question and we'll discuss that in a minute or we're discussing that now so basically if you if you address the two different levels of deficits that i just addressed the unsolved problem and the unattended need what are what do they mean on the product level what are the different the product properties so you could say well if you only look at fundamental aware rational problems then you then the, the solutions the things that address these would be a thing that serves a purpose and this is exactly what we the scope of engineering design uh, when we discussed last semester we we talked about functions purpose and a function is either a material or a signal flow or an energy flow uh, that 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 is an input to our technical system that we want to design and the technical system will kind of manipulate these flows and there will be a different output so really we define the scope of engineering design by the kind of function that the objects fulfill that we engineer that we design now we just mentioned that many things have a much more complex purpose most things also have a, a, a purpose a, a technical function but on top of that it could create an emotionally positive experience while you use it or it just makes the owner more happy because he's or she's the owner and that's again the uh, the image here the the popular rolex watch uh, which I have to say, aesthetically, I find very pleasing too. But then there's a lot of meaning that comes with that, a lot of image that comes with the Rolex brand. That even if I could uh, afford one, and you you have to be stinking rich if you have a family to really be able to afford one, uh, I probably wouldn't buy it uh, because I just believe that the Rolex would express something that is not me. But I love the whole engineering and quality aspect of that. Rolex is, is interesting. It, it takes them literally years to make Rolexes because they have a million stages of quality assurance. So it's, it's a great piece of technology. Uh, but then uh, if I were that one, that would probably tell the wrong story about me. It would not match my personality. So I'll stick with Casio for a while. Anyhow, so I said it already, meaning right meaning basically is the key word uh, or i say meaning of a thing is the key word that we're dealing with when we're dealing with design aesthetic design styling so uh this meaning uh is is really the key aspect of the object when when it's uh when the second category of objects that addresses the higher needs um and this this one word meaning sums up the very complex universe of design the best way now how do we perceive this meaning uh we perceive it as emotions right uh so we don't analyze the meaning like the meaning of a text right what what does that word mean what does that what what do these instructions mean that is again uh, a process of understanding that we're aware of that is very rational but here we're talking about very complex meanings that you can analyze there are methods to to do that but normally we don't do that but instead the meaning unfolds itself as an emotional reaction right in our brain or heart or whatever organ is necessary for that it uh, it processes this uh, the signals that that we perceive through our eyes or other organs of perception and then our brain uh, and heart turns this information uh, basically understands that information assigns meaning to it and then the reaction we get is not an understanding a rational understanding but instead an emotional response right so i think everybody can agree on that that we're basically dealing with the emotional aspects of these products and again the reason why these emotional reactions exist 
or it, it could be said, and this is a theory, basically we're talking about design theory here, is because of meaning, right? So we're saying an object has a meaning, or basically not one meaning, but has a lot of meaning, and it's different kinds of meanings. It will also be rational meaning, right? Let's, let's say this thing, uh, you, you see it, you know, oh, wow, that's, that's a smartphone. It's a communication device and much more, right? So yeah, there is a rational meaning that is assigned to an object because of how we see it. But it goes, but there are also aspects of meaning that, that are much more complex because they are not directly fixed to, to rational things like a, a technical purpose or a technical function. So the concept, the, the idea uh, that we're talking about, about the, the core theory of design is called product language or product semantics. Uh, and again, the, uh, the pioneers of this idea, they, they wrote uh, down their ideas, they published their, their ideas in the 1970s. That there's a lot of initial thinking that's before that, but, but personally, I, I refer to a series of publications by a gentleman called Gross, uh, who who was active in, uh, let's say, the context of a university of design in Germany, Offenbach. Uh, but there are a lot of other people all around the world, like the USA and Japan, that, that came up with, uh, with this concept that we're really talking about meaning, that, that objects are, are, have meaning in them, they carry meaning. And of course, an object doesn't have a meaning by itself, right? It's, it's, it's us, when we see something, we assign meaning to it. So what the objects are, they're really symbols, right? Now what a symbol actually means de depends on the person that is looking at, at the symbol, right? Um, so when we're talking about the theory of design, you could say, well, it is actually the theory of symbols. Now an actual symbol has a meaning, but not by itself, it needs uh, a recipient or an in interpreter of the symbol. And of course, the symbol itself must reference something, right? And, and uh, so the science, again, is, is the science of symbols that we're looking at, and it's called semiotics. So the underlying science of product semantics is semiotics. And if you think this is completely crazy, you never heard about it, that's not, probably not true because you, you, you learn about language science and language theory in school. And um, a language is actually a set of symbols, right? So uh, the rules that define language are basically kind of rules that, that exist in all different sets of symbols. So in semiotics, so we, uh, actually, I, I mentioned something uh, before, and I will uh, go into that, that, that makes that a bit clearer, that you, all of you have uh, some understanding of semiotics because you learned languages. And even better, as engineers, you probably all learned something about programming. Now, programming uses language. And... Uh, I, I would guess most engineers, they only have, they only remember one aspect of language or how it can go wrong. When you try programming or coding, you get the message syntax error. Now, that, that word syntax actually is a key term in semiotics. And it, what it means in programming, it means, well, basically that command line that you've written is wrong. Uh, the order, of the different yeah, words uh, is wrong, probably, or there's something missing, there's one element, one word missing, so there's a syntax error. Now, uh, syntax is one key concept of semiotics, which exists because there's a triadic relation in semiotics. And I've said it five minutes ago, a symbol doesn't have a meaning by itself. A symbol only has a meaning if it references a real object or a, a real thing, another thing, because the symbol is always a symbol for something, right? And on top of that, the meaning unfolds only in the brain or heart 
of the interpreter, a person that needs to see the symbol and say, yeah, well, that symbol means this. Uh, and and the, the most easy to understand symbols would be uh, maybe icons and instructions how to use something or signs. These are symbols that have a, have a meaning that people agree on, right? Uh, so let's say um, on, on, on TVs, there is the, uh, the circle, the kind of circular object. Do I have anything? Oh yeah, I have my remote control, but it doesn't have that symbol. Um, but, but basically that's a symbol that indicates on off or on all video players and all tape recorders, this little triangle that points to the right is a symbol for play, right? For go on, for start, start this thing. Uh, so again, if, if you, if you take this triangle on, onto a different planet with different beings, they would probably not understand what this symbol means, right? Because they lack the context. So. Uh, the meaning of that symbol, it refers to something which is the activity of going on or proceeding to play the movie, but it only really becomes a symbol. It only really gets the meaning if, if people understand that, if they're aware of that. That depends on the culture, right? Or, of the education, the training, whatever of the people. Now, uh, that's called a triadic relation that you have to have the symbol itself or the sign rather. In this case, I call it a sign in this. You have a user or the interpreter, the person reading a word, for example, and uh, then whatever it refers to. That is the model of all more general semiotics. Now, the uh, graphic you see here is already using words words which are specific to object design to product design so i didn't say interpreter but i i said the user of something and with symbols i i generalize that as a sign and there are two levels of meaning basically um because even with uh with with more general symbols they, they often have two levels of meaning which is called uh, denotation and connotation. Now, denotation is the meaning that has been agreed on by a large group of people. For example, I, I could just use language as example. Uh, the word door, for example, the word door is a symbol for a real door, right? I say door and I mean a real object. So the word is a symbol for the object, right? Now, if you speak the same language, English, as I do, you will understand what that word, the written word or the spoken word, the sound door means. It means that that thing, right, that, that opens or closes a hole in the wall. If you don't know the language, the symbol is meaningless to you, right? So that's, but that's an example for uh, den a denotation for a denot denotative meaning of a symbol which everybody agrees on everybody who speaks english understands the word door means that thing you can open and close uh, that will cover the hole in a door uh, in a wall of a building or, or a vehicle or something whatever however most symbols also have what's called a, a connotation which means a meaning that everybody understands differently, which is like the second level of meaning. For example, door, if I just say the door, right, then I could actually be telling somebody to leave, right? So you could say a door, the second level of meeting, uh, meaning refers to uh, a transition, refers to a change, to somebody leaving or coming in, right? So it, uh, the door, People say, this is the door to something. And they mean it's not a real door, but it's more like a symbol for an uh, opportunity, for example. So that's the second level of meaning, which is called denotation. Uh, and um, this is why I have two triangles here, because what I want to indicate here is that any sign, any symbol, but also any product will have meaning that is... Uh, generally agreed on and all people will understand the same, but also a lot of meaning that people will individually uh, assign different meanings to. And, and, and this means, and this basically explains why some people like some things 
but other people like other things uh, because it depends on your individual background, how you feel about something. And in this case, what, what, uh, what, what second level meaning you assign to something. If it's something that you uh, relate to uh, positive feelings, positive experience or negative or n not at all. Something might not mean anything to you. You might see, you might see a symbol or you might hear a word and it doesn't stir you at all. You don't have, you just don't care. Yeah, you have no you know positive and no negative association with it. Um, so, so if you understand this this concept of symbols, uh, you might ask yourself the question: Well, how does that? How can I use that for product design? What what does that mean more specifically? Now that's a very good question, and it hasn't been fully answered. It's still highly uh, controversial. In, in among design theorists, if the idea of product semantics really gives you uh, anything that you could use methodolic method as a method, uh, as a tool to create better designs. And um, it's still kind of agreed on that this theory does not allow you to develop like a step-by-step -step synthesis of great designs. But what it does offer is, um, a, a structured discussion of different aspects of meaning or of symbolism uh, about products. And that will help you for analyzing existing design. Um, it will help you to analyze interactions of objects and people, because of course the meaning, the perceived meaning of an object will dictate how people deal with it, how they operate it. And I have some some examples uh, at the end of this. Um, so it's good for education, good for analysis, uh, but it doesn't really give you detailed instructions of how to design, right? So I can't give you that too. So uh, so there are different, uh, of course, a lot of authors that dealt with that, and and I really enjoy uh, this specific school uh, of design theory, and it's called the uh, Offenbach approach. Um, and Offenbach is is the location of that university where where this idea was developed in the 1970s, which is basically a Hochschule für Gestaltung Offenbach (HFG), which means basically a University of Applied Sciences with a focus or applied arts rather. Um, and uh, and here it is basically. So this one says, and this is not the original graphic from 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 Offenbach, but but I, I put this, this spectrum on top of it to, to demonstrate one other aspect. So what it says is any object, any artifact, or actually not only artifacts, but, but any object at all can have a practical uh, purpose, can be used to fulfill a practical function. We've already dealt with that. That's the gray box on the left side. So any object could have uh, could, uh, this ability to transform a material or signal uh, flow or energy flow and therefore have a practical function that engineers can deal with. But also any object will have semantic funct functions and this is basically this, what I, what I mentioned, this, uh, this idea of having a symbolic meaning and therefore uh, sharing willingly or unwillingly some sort of information with the interpreter. Um, and what we'll do next is to break down the different aspects of these semantic functions. Now, um, what this this spectrum in the middle means is that that objects will might have different might have these two different types of functions to varying degrees. Uh, and what is interesting is the extreme ends of the spectrum. So if you have an object, a man-made object that has no practical function at all, you call that artwork, right? So any real art doesn't have a practical function at all. It only exists. To, to have a meaning, right? Uh, and then any object that has no, uh, well, you could say no semantic function at all, basically that means people cannot see, hear, or smell, or feel it. Because as soon as you can see, smell, hear, or feel it, it will have a meaning to you, right? Your, your brain will kind of process that that sensory information. So that means uh, something that will have a practical function, but no semantic function at all, doesn't seem to exist. 
but it still does something. It fulfills a function. That would be like magic almost. Uh, and we have some technologies that are pretty close to that, like microchips, right? They're really small. We almost cannot see, hear, feel, or smell them, but they still do a lot of things, right? So that's uh, it, the theoretical uh, um, left end of that scale. It's called an ideal product. It does something without existing physically. And if it doesn't exist physically, we, we don't have sensory information. We don't see, smell, hear, or feel it. So we cannot assign any meaning to it. So it doesn't have semantic functions. Okay. I hope I'm not breaking your mind by this point. Um, so semantic functions can be broken down. And, and this is where, where uh, kind of the, uh, the parallels to language science should become a bit more apparent. Now in language, we have words, right? And for very basic communication, it's, it's good enough to know words, right? So if you don't speak a language very well, you can still only use words uh, for, for very basic concepts. For example, I can say, water, right, when I'm thirsty. Or I can say, thirsty, or I can say, food, right? Uh, I just recently saw a comic with, uh, on the TV of my kid where there was some alien being that just said, food, food, food. And you understand, oh, that, that being is hungry and it wishes for uh, food right, to satisfy the hunger, but it uses only one word. Uh, so that's not a sentence. And as you know, in, in languages, um, we typically construct more complex meaning by putting together many words. And there are rules of how these words are put together. Uh, and this, these rules are called syntax. Right? This is why if you do bad programming, uh, bad coding, it will tell you this command line has a syntax error, which means we put the words together in the wrong way. Um, so you could also say, going back to that triadic relation to that triangle, syntax regulates how different symbols, the rules between how you you uh, you organize different symbols. Actually, that's not in the triadic uh, triadic relation. I have to I have to uh, correct myself there. When you when you de when you define how a symbol relates to the actual object, like the word door relates to that that thing, that's called semantics. So semantics, the word semantics actually means the meaning of things, uh, the meaning of symbols. Sorry, and what we how well, when we talk about the relation between the interpreter and the symbol, that's called pragmatics. So for example, people from different countries speaking different having a different background, they, they might assign different meanings to the same word. Uh, there are zillions of examples, but at the moment I can't, can't come up with, with a clever one. But especially, let's say, English, or English as you speak it in the UK and English as you speak it in the USA, uh, there's a lot of words that have completely different meanings in both countries. That would be, uh, that would be an example for pragmatics, how they can be differently. So anyhow, this diagram here only talks about uh, different aspects of symbolism in product design. And uh, when we talk about semantics, that would be sign functions, what different meanings different symbols have. And there are two different uh, kinds of meanings or kind of symbols in product design. The most, uh, the most rational technology-based one would be the so-called indicating functions. Um, so something might indicate that it is a mobile phone, right? Uh, so this shape indicates that it's a mobile phone because we know what a mobile phone looks like, but uh, definitely it's, it's about the function, right? So that will be an indicating function designed in a way so you can indicate uh, first the character, what it is. Well, it's like a not very new mobile phone. It's a smartphone. And there's a button, that is a nice example, right? So this thing here, round circle, we know uh, that this is something we, we push. We know it's a button and because of the way it is designed, right? Um, so that's an indication of function, bottom right. Or these little holes here, right? We know there's a camera behind that and not only because we are intelligent people, but uh, and we know we have to hold it like that. We know that this slot here probably is a speaker because we expect to hold it to our ear like that. Something like that. That would be 
indication of function. Indication of character uh, is basically everything that is not function that could include materials, production processes, is something old or new, is it used or unused, and so on, right? Now, these are very rational functions. We as engineers, we can easily relate to that. The other kind of functions are all this stuff that we have problems dealing with. Uh, these are the symbolic functions, so more complex meanings. And uh, we will not be able to un understand that fully or apply it, but we can discuss it. Uh, so there are two subcategories, sub and I will briefly deal with these, which are called association and symbol complexes. Again, there's a few slides to come. Now, the aesthetic functions, it's a completely separate box. Obviously, it's not a sign function. So the aesthetic functions don't have a meaning. That is interesting. Aesthetic functions are not meant to have a meaning by, by themselves. So what are they? You could say they are the syntax of product semantics. Aesthetics organize the different symbols, like syntax organizes the different words in a language how to put them. And uh, this is maybe shocking because you, you all know the word aesthetics and probably you, you, you believe that aesthetic means beauty. And it's not completely wrong if you use it in everyday language. People say aesthetics and mean it's beautiful, right? But, uh, but really, as the word aesthetics has a more scientific, a deeper meaning. It has something to do about perception. It is also a term that is, is used in psychology when uh, when people discuss scientifically what what sensory information people get and what their what information is produced from these sensory signals, right? Uh, and 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 this field of science, uh, the science of sensory information and how this is processed by the human minds is basically aesthetics, perceptual psychology, and so on. That's we could talk about this for hours, but we will not. Just believe me, within psychology, uh, there are, there's a lot of research being done that deals with perception. And the reason uh, uh, Yanni Laurel thing, I don't know if you've already stumbled over that, but this dates this lecture, by the way. Yanni Laurel, very interesting example of sensory information and how the same signal, in this case it's an acoustic signal, will, will arrive in our brains completely different. If you haven't seen it yet after the lecture, look it up, Yanni or Laura on YouTube. It's a, a, a language scientist, basically has, has created, computer created a sound. Some people hear the word Laurel when they hear that sound. Other people hear the word Yanni. My wife hears Yanni. I hear Laurel, right? Uh, and this, uh, it, of course it can be explained, but it seems like magic and it seems like dark magic. So, so basically uh, aesthetic function, of course, it, it will deal with visual aesthetics. It will deal with how you arrange stuff, it will deal with proportions and, and, and shapes and so on. But in, the, in this theory here, it says, well, the aesthetics really only arrange different symbols. Now, what is a symbol in design that has no practical function? Now, this is a symbol that has a practical function or it relates to a practical function. It's a, it's a button. If I push it, I identify myself and I, I indicate my want to access an, uh, another function, like an app or something. But it's also, you could say it's an ornament, right? It's a nice circle, but it's not an old ornament because it has a function. Now, if I just put a... Uh, a circle on my phone and it doesn't have a function that will be an ornament right and i i can use these ornaments uh just well and this is always the thing if it doesn't have a practical function it can still have a meaning right so uh but that that meaning might might not relate again to a, a practical function right so it might be a bit more complex and aesthetics kind of uh um they would, in the most general definition, aesthetics would would uh, would be uh, the rules or features how different symbols or ornaments are, are arranged on a existing design. Now, again, before I go on, I, I have to say 
this is again this is a diagram that splits that that lays in front of us the different aspects of product semantics it does not help us to make a great design so we, we can't sit down and then step by step define aesthetic functions define symbolic functions and put it all together this approach we do in engineering design where we break down a practical function into many sub functions and then we find working principles for them doesn't work here in semantic uh, in, in the concept of product semantics right only really for discussion so so here's one one text slide i, I put in there for you mostly for reading uh, because i mentioned all these aspects already semantic functions sub, sub summarizing are about meaning uh, some people and, and books uh, say it's about communication but i think that's misleading because it's not really like uh, a hidden a secret a message that somebody wants to give right it's more like okay this thing has a meaning but what the meaning what we make of that meaning depends on us individually at, at least to some degree right uh, and often this meaning is used for people to communicate among each other right i'm wearing a specific t-shirt because i i want to communicate about my personality actually with this t-shirt i don't really want to i was just sloppy but if i go out I wear a suit and a shirt. I want to communicate about my professional style, blah, 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 and good education. And it will help me to communicate with other people. So you could say these things have a meaning. They are an offer. They are something we can use for communication. But the thing doesn't communicate with us. Uh, or it's not the company. It's not the designer that wants to communicate with us. It just provides meaning. We can use the meaning to communicate within our social net network and then there's some people call about formal degree of freedom which is limited through technical functions uh, but really that is again I, I would argue with that uh, it's not like we are artists when we design and we just want artistic freedom it's more like if we have technical restrictions these are important aspects of the product so good designers visualize them right so really uh, they create they might create extra ornaments to make the point of the technical restrictions, or they might just visualize, for example, production restrictions, and they become part of the symbolism of the object, which makes us understand how it works, how it was done, and how we should not use it, for example. Right? So what we'll discuss now is the Offenbach, Ansatz, uh, Offenbach approach. And it's basically one of many existing uh, approaches of the concept of product semantics and how it's been how it's been used. So I'll, I'll give you a, a few slides, not to further confuse you, just to show you what what it really boils down to. It's more like a tool that helps us understanding aspects of design. So, and then one thing that that we discussed is engineering design. We're problem solvers, right? So we we are aware of problems, and then we explicitly and rationally discuss options to solve these problems and industrial design even if they would like to be problem solvers too but really their domain is more like uh really uh, making propositions uh symbolic propositions and people will accept them as something they want to have because it can serve their needs or not so really if an engineer comes up with a solution for a problem all people should agree if, if that engineer has done good work or people will say yeah this is a good solution to that problem or not but with design with industrial design that's not the case we'll have a group of people that will say wow beautiful i want to have it while another group of people will say nah it doesn't mean anything to me right and that's also a very big difference between industrial design and engineering design and then the last thing that I said is, well, we have this model of different classes of semantic functions, but it doesn't help us to synthesize the design. So it's not really a step-by-step -step workflow. So um, this is uh, the same scale I've given you to already uh, on the top of that, um, that diagram that shows semantic functions. This is just to show to you uh, what different kind of products might be on different positions of the scale. So we already discussed the extreme ends. Uh, ideal product and artwork we've already mentioned the microchip as being something that has almost no semantic function although if i show you a photograph of it you will 
that will do something with you, with your brain, with your emotions. <coughs> but it's obviously very close to the ideal product because you can hardly see it, especially if it's inside of the product. And then there's a machine tool, for example, that has mostly technical function, but to some degree also semantic function. You need to make it operable, so you need to design it so so the the operator will has will have less of a hard time understanding how to work with it. A car, for example, has a practical purpose, right? But then depending on what of uh, depending on what kind of car we talk about, the semantic function might be really important, right? A car uh, is also uh, representing the owner. Uh, it's a status symbol that makes the semantic function very important with many cars. And then, of course, the watch I mentioned a million times. It's a watch, you could say, has a practical purpose of measuring the time or showing the time. But it's actually, it's more like, like jewelry. It's more a decoration of the owner. So jewelry would be even closer. Jewelry has no practical purpose. It's, it's only there to, to say something, to have a meaning. Uh, about the person that's wearing it or the person that's giving it as a present to somebody else, right? Uh, the point here is that uh, the, it's not the practical function alone that de determines where an object is on the scale. To make that point, I'm giving you five different um, objects that uh, are used to take the juice out of lemons or oranges, and uh, they can be designed completely different. Uh, based on how important the, the practical function is in real or or the practical and rational aspects in comparison to the semantic aspect. So on the left side that looks like a sculpture. It is its practical purpose is to again squeeze the juice out of oranges or lemons, but it's a beautiful sculpture. So here you could say, yeah, on that scale it would be on the far right side. Similar to uh, the second object B. Uh, which is a very manual, rudimentary tool to take uh, the juice out of lemons. It's also, it received design awards. Uh, and we don't need to discuss what exactly makes this uh, an object that needs to be awarded. Um, but obviously here the semantic function is very important. Now example C is a great example of, of something that almost everybody has at home. And that will be on the extreme left side of the spectrum because this is not designed to be uh, beautiful or meaningful or express something about the taste and personality of the owner, uh, but it's just made to be as functional and as cheap and as easily cleanable as possible. So here the technical practical function definitely is in the focus. Uh, and then the objects on the right side, um, Discuss them for yourselves. I mean, they have a lot of practical functions. The uh, example E, for example, is something that looks like it might be used uh, in a professional kitchen, maybe uh, maybe in a cocktail bar, right? So obviously, it's very important that it looks great, right? High importance of semantic functions, but it's also highly important that the technical functions work really well. So you can't really say it's left or right. It would be maybe center and both importances of both kinds of functions are really high. So let's look at uh, Offenbach Ansatz. Let's look at the different kinds of uh, semantic functions. And we'll start with the aesthetics, which are not symbols. But again, it's, it's, a, a, it's basically a system of organization. Um, and there's a lot of background to that that we won't discuss. But I'm just telling you that, OK, this is about organizing symbols. So the general uh, discussion here is, is it a highly orderful way of organizing symbols or is it a very complex approach to organizing symbols? So, so how you discuss that, how it is discussed, let's say in engineering, ed, uh, in design education in Offenbach is always through word pairs that represent the tension between order and complexity. So for example, the, pair, the word pair simple and manifold. That is one example uh, of how you could discuss different designs which represents order and complexity. Closed or open, proximity, distance, continuous 
discontinuous, uniform, non-uniform, or heterogeneous, symmetric, unsymmetric. We look at a few examples. This is not engineering science. It's not natural sciences. It's just a way of organizing our mind, of structuring our thinking when we look at design examples in order to, to make us more aware of how we see a design, right? Uh, you see two chairs here, and uh, the left one is, is meant to be a symbol for order itself. Uh, and it is a design classic. It's, uh, it's called LC2, or actually it's called uh, LC2, uh, LC2, because it's a French name, Le Fauteuil Grand Comfort by Le Corbusier. Uh, absolute design classic. For sure, there are thousands of these in Bangkok. Maybe not originals, but, but, but copies. This is uh, almost like an archetype of modern design. And then on the right side, you see uh, somebody making fun of that original design by a guy called Kub Himmelblau. And he called it Vaudeur, uh, German Umlaut. You see the O with the two dots. And this is obviously a spoof. This is making fun of Fauteuil, the French original name, Vaudeur. Um, and and if you if you look at it, if you understand the concept, you would see, yeah, this is tr is, is is it looks like a nightmare of the same chair. It has all the elements, uh, so that there is still a seating possible. It has the same size, and basically all the elements are there. Uh, even the 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 chrome colored steel uh, uh, tube, but it's just it's been completely taken in a different way and basically uh, you could say well yeah it, it's it has taken the high order of the original design and turned it into complexity everything that was rule-based symmetric orderly with the original chair is now non-symmetric not using uh, uh, simple forms uh, but complex forms and um, on top of that it's not relating to practical function not always although this chair you can sit on it you can see the seating surface is still a horizontal surface of the same size. So you can still sit on that thing the same way you would sit on the uh, original chair. But when you see it, it does something completely different to your mind. Um, and that's an interesting example for uh, the difference between order and complexity. So I'll give you a few more nice pictures uh, to make the points. Uh, again, don't look at it as an engineer. Look, look at it as somebody who enjoys seeing beautiful things or how completely different approaches can also be beautiful, but in a different way. So, um, so here we're not, we're not discussing meaning of it now. We're not discussing your emotional reaction to these, but uh, this is just examples of uh, uh, formal aesthetics the discussion of order and complexity. And this would be one slide of highly orderly or simple shapes. And you achieve that by regular geometric shapes. So the left design, obviously the chair is, um, is based on the idea of a sphere of a ball. So that's one of the most simple geometric bodies. And the right hand side, probably you guess this would be a microwave, but this is actually a TV. Um, of the golden days when we didn't have uh, flat displays, but we still had these vacuum tubes, which were really long. So all TVs were re had really long housings. And most designers, most companies would try to hide this length by making it a kind of uh, tapper, the housing tapper away to the back. But this designer said, to hell with it. I will celebrate the size of that thing. And um, so he made a shining black cube out of it. And uh, this would actually be called modern design. This is what most people misunderstand the word modern as new. It's not. Modern is a style set of reduced aesthetics, of using regular shapes and reduction, not using ornaments and so on. Anyhow, this is like a historic design artifact. Um, here, here are other historic design artifacts that are also based on geometrical bodies. Uh, which are design classics, if you're interested in that. Uh, um, the left one is a famous lamp from the 1920s from the Bauhaus Institute. So everybody who's really like interested in 
the history of design and, and design itself will know this lamp. And the concept here is to use only geomet geometrical shapes. If you're an engineer, we would call that uh, uh, rule-based surfaces, and we would be able to make a technical drawing out of that and would be completely defined by dimensions, right? Same to the chair on the right side. I could make a technical drawing of that. I could describe the shape 100% with dimensions. Now that would be simple, which means highly ordered geometry. Here's an example of manifold or highly complex shapes. And we discussed that already, especially in CAET. That would, technically we would refer, refer to that as free form surfaces, highly complex surfaces described uh, well, it can't be described by a set of dimensions. I cannot make a drawing of that thing and define the geometry fully by using dimensions. It's completely impossible, right? So I can I can only if I want to make uh, if I want to get an injection molding uh, tool made to make this chair, uh, I would have to give the 3D data set to the people, right? And uh, so that's freeform surfacing. Or you could say it's a sculpture, a complex sculpture, and it's uh, uh, from the from the 1940s. La chaise, which also means the chair, <laughs> right? But it sounds so much better when you say it in French. Uh, okay, also a design classic. Design people will know that. I've taken this image from some online dealer, so you can buy these things. Uh, so the original intellectual properties has expired. Uh, people can now produce that and sell it. So here's another example uh, of, of the opposite pairs uh, of uh, order and complexity. Here it's uh, um, uh, closed by proximity, open by distance. So both are chairs again, left-hand side. You would say this is a modern design of a chair, but it's not. It's actually a postmodern design of a chair. Um, made from arming steel rods and concrete a chair and it's called solid although it's obviously not solid right but it creates the image of solid surfaces by using thin steel bars in a large proximity or small distance on the right hand side uh, you also have a chair where the backrest is created by uh, thin beams but here the distance of them is much larger so this looks open uh, and you could go on for the rest of your life looking at designs, discussing them in the by word pairs that represent order and complexity of product, uh, of, 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 of formal aesthetics. We won't do that. I will not ask you to apply any of that. I just want to create some sort of understanding of the world, uh, an introduction to the world of design. There's actually cool movies we can watch too. Um, I will give you some movie hints at the at the end of the lecture. Okay, now indicating functions. Now this is something that we can relate to, um, and we will relate to that. So this is everything that relates to function and character of the things. So function. Now I mean the functions uh, that engineers work on. So uh, really uh, something that has a purpose, um, which relates to the practical function of the object. So. There are many uh, in the, uh, function indicators like the orientation of something. Where's the front? Where's the back of that drill or the gun? How do I handle it? Uh, which buttons do I have to push? Um, relation to the human body. How do I hold it? Uh, is it movable or adjustable? Does it stand uh, in a stable way? Uh, can I stack it? And so on. This would be, and it, this list is, is endless, right? But it, basically, it is about indicating which means visualizing uh, the practical aspects of something then the indication of character uh, first one would be identification of something so this is a drill this is uh, um, a laser gun this is a stunner uh, uh, this is a mixer for school or a blend uh, for, for for kitchen a blender right uh, this is a mobile phone as opposed to a remote control. Um, and then characteristics, uh, which is, again, an infinite list of aspects which, uh, which define characteristics. So, for example, what material, uh, what production techniques have been used, 
again, has it been used a lot or is it new and so on. So again, just a few examples here. Uh, so this will be, again, pretty rationally understandable. Uh, this, this would be uh, indicating how to handle, where to grab something by these black little dots. This was very popular in the early 2000s with a lot of things. Uh, it, you see the same thing on Swiss army knives, uh, um, um, eyeglasses, uh, pens, everywhere, right? This, these are examples for uh, designing something so the orientation becomes clear. On the left side, I believe there's some sort of vending machine which very, in a subtle way and clever way, uh, seems to be looking at you like a little child. It seems to be looking up at you. Uh, so that, that would help one person without having to think about it, where to turn your direction to. There's a lot of terribly designed vending machines out there where you, you just look around, where's the information that I'm, that I'm looking for? Uh, like, like parking tickets. There's one, uh, wildly terrible design of a, of a parking ticket machine that I often have to use where each and every time I, I have to look for a minute to find out how much money I have to pay and where to put the money, where to put the parking card, and so on and so on. Now then there's this uh, drill or rather uh, um, battery powered um, um, screwing thing on the bottom, which is pretty obvious where, uh, how you orient it, where's the front, where's the back, and so on. Stand functions, right? This one indicates that it can stay stand uh, um, uh, in in a, in a solid and a stable kind of way by by uh, visualizing uh, the foot, the weight of the foot, when, in case of the the Apple uh, desktop computer or the bench. I would just race through them. You can you can look at the examples later on. Of this slide, this is uh, indicating uh, the the orientation to the human body. The example that I like most is the electric toothbrush on the top. Now, uh, if we were together, I would kind of test you, show me how to use it, and uh, everybody kind of can Im immediately imagine that you pick this up with your right hand because this little bow here around the button, where's my mouse? Hang on. This one kind of, in a very intuitive way, kind of relates to your thumb of the right hand, but then if you're left-handed, this thing will just feel terrible to use. You feel, if you're left-handed, if you want to brush your teeth with your left hand, to pick this thing up will kind of feel wrong in a very subtle way. And you might not even be aware of that. It will just kind of, you will not like that thing so much, right? For some reason, I guess. Maybe some, some, some people will not just, will not feel anything about it, right? Um, here's, Here's some examples showing uh, on the left side that you can uh, indicate precision by repetitive elements like patterns. That's something you might have found out by yourself. If you, if you do patterns on your CAD, C, CAD modeling like Creo, the, uh, after you've established a pattern, your design seems so much more valuable already, right? And then uh, right-hand side just indicates uh, human body relations like uh, like where to grip it again, uh, how the, the grip of that, that window cleaning thing on the bottom is, is really close to the shape of the hand and that, uh, that protective device for the knee, uh, obviously references the knee. I really like that, that CD player that I've given to you. So I, I just show it again. This was designed for Muji and, uh, it's actually a plastic box but it gains so much more in perceived value by that pattern of little holes on the front. Imagine that, that thing without these holes, it would just look like, like a snack box, right? Um, and then finally, symbolic functions. Again, I'm not claiming that uh, this will increase your skills as a designer. I just kind of want to lay out the different categories of, of symbolic functions here. And as you can see, there are two main groups. Uh, the associations, which are kind of easy to discuss. Uh, so basically, this means we can relate, we can attribute qualities to the object that are not really attributes of the object. For example, it could appear to be masculine or feminine. feminine. 
man or woman, even if it's obviously not a thing of gender. It could be old or young or weak or strong and so on. And that's pretty easy to understand. I'll show you one example for that. And then we have symbol complexes. And that basically is, is the container for everything that is relevant for design, but it doesn't fit in the other categories. And yes, that is a bit critical on my behalf on that theory. Uh, so basically, it puts all the design styles, symbol complexes, which mean, means collection of symbols. You could say ornaments. It, it would be collections of ornaments. And these ornaments basically are specific to styles. So you can imagine a different style could be a historic style. Like it looks very old because it has all these little ornaments. Um, so that, that typically that could be relating to a, an era that is past already, an epoch. So here you will find all the words, the different epochs that are used in arts, right? The art of this time, the art of this country is called, for example, classicism, Baroque, or uh, Jugendstil, or Art Nouveau, okay? No need for us to study that unless you enjoy it, of course. If, you, if you're really into that, into the culture and style of objects and historic, um, historic styles, beautiful way to spend your time, um, especially with the internet. Now everything is on the internet. And then there's partial styles. This would be styles that coexist during the same time. Typically, if a time is long over, we often say, well, during that time, there was this one style, which, which is not true. During every time, there were many different styles, but some of them were just not, they didn't make it, so to speak. They were just not good enough to be remembered hundreds of years later. So nowadays, uh, Many, many different styles coexist, and people talk about different styles in different ways. So they could call it a specific look, or it could be a regional style, like uh, like uh, Indian style would be different from Thai style, or American style would be uh, different from English style, and so on. Um, or it could be a style specific for a specific designer or for a brand, and so on. So here's just one example of. Uh, associations now please don't ask me why this is suddenly german on the top so this just means associations uh, uh in need of protection or aggressive so we have the little cat which is always the symbol of oh so lovely and it makes us want to protect it right and you can you can find uh objects that are that are rising the same emotional reaction for example this beautiful old little uh, uh, Fiat 500. That kind of looks like a little animal, a little bug that that needs our love and protection, right? Now, this car, uh, this design is so iconic that it's been used. Uh, it's it's almost like a well, it's a cultural object, right? So it's referenced in the cars movies, and Fiat has redesigned their own car. I would say as a reaction to other car companies being very uh, successful i think it started with the with the austin mini which is which was owned by or still owned by bmw that that reissued the original mini design other car companies followed that had a long history revisiting the old uh, original design and fiat did it too it's a pretty car the new fiat 500 is pretty but it definitely is has a different character right it it doesn't feel it doesn't make you feel caring about it you don't need want to protect it it seems to be a uh, a car that has much more self-confidence uh, than the original fiat 500 right uh, anyhow here's a different car and it uh it's still german uh, but this is uh, obviously the uh no the car is not german that's a that is a lamborghini i'm pretty sure um and obviously this doesn't want to look like you need to protect it it seems more like a weapon to be honest it seems something like something you hold in your hand to to hurt somebody right with all these edges and its aggressive stance right so obviously obviously true for cars you can associate uh, qualities that are more like human qualities to objects obviously by means of association and then you can try uh, to um, apply design concepts to other objects. For example, this 
Uh, this is a taser. It says taser on the hand grip. This is a weapon that is used especially by US American police to stun people. So I think you've seen it in the movies for sure. So ba that, that basically that, that uh, um, kind of hooks electrical cables to people and then you can send electric shock waves to them to, uh, to make them subordinate. And there's, um, there's been a lot of studies when this was introduced that of a lot of abuse of American uh, police officials by this. Um, and I, I, I like to make the point that the very aggressive design of this thing is probably not a good idea. It makes, it makes the people who use it feel like punishers, right? Uh, so I always say maybe it would be a better idea to give it a more fluffy, soft uh, design so people would not feel inclined to uh, get on a power trip when using it. Mm -hmm. And of course, then with a lot of weapons, you see... Uh, specific design that it really looks like a weapon. It doesn't only work like a weapon, but it already has this moment of, of aggressiveness in its design. This is one example of a designer style, uh, most unlikely that you are aware of Kolani. Even a lot of the younger Germans or, or Europeans are not aware of this guy anymore. But in the 80s, especially in the 80s and probably 90s, uh, Kolani was just everywhere. Uh, he was so popular and he had his own style. So people would see a thing and they would say, well, this is Kolani style, right? And actually, this is not a sign this, uh, of, of good design. Typically, designers shouldn't be artists that leave their style, uh, but design is, is, should serve the purpose. And at the moment, I would say uh, designer styles are not popular too. Um, it's more like brand styles. You would say, oh, this one looks like Apple, for example, right? Um, but but Kulani did great stuff. He, he was also somebody who uh, uh, took great consideration of aspects of practica practicability. And he was visionary. I mean, uh, this, uh, this kitchen on the left-hand side, this is an experimental kitchen of how small you could make a highly functional kitchen. And this is from the end of the 1960s. And it looks like it's from a brand new science fiction movie. And, uh, well, if you don't take into account the fashion that the lady is wearing, although even that, that, that would still look good today. And then you see the trucks. Uh, now, this is something he did in the 1980s or even earlier. I remember when that came out. And it suddenly resurfaced again. It still looks so brand new. Uh, that um, a media mark, uh, some, some retailer for, elect for electronics, uh, dug these old designs out to demonstrate how modern they were, decades after Colani designed that. And then on the bottom right, you see that it was uh, a, a sports car he designed, which has a cult following. Now, this is basically the end of this lecture. I'm, I'm a bit late, but I, I started late. Sorry about that. Uh, I have two examples here where which I would like to discuss, which you should be able to, to understand uh, as how uh, the idea of product, product semantics can be useful. Now, this is the door opener at TGGS. You know that. You see my ID card here. This one uh, will open the, the back door uh, of the TGGS building. And this would be uh, a design that... Um, well, it communicates with you because it tells you what you should do, right? If you see this box, even if you don't know the building, of course, I know the building. I enter it every day. Uh, but even if you, if you see that box for the first time, then you know, okay, well, there's a light on it and it's right next to the door. Uh, it's obviously there to identify me if I should be granted access or not. So that would be something that is uh used in the right way it will it will without thinking of it i will place my card in front of it and will uh then through the card will identify me the light will change to green then i know now the door is unlocked i can push it open this is fine now this thing we all know it too this is on the front door exit now uh, that's actually i took the photo on the rear door too but we have the same thing on the front door of tgs exit and uh, you know it, and I don't know if you become self-aware, this thing makes me feel stupid every time. I never know what to do with it. And I really have to kick in my, my rational brain to tell myself that I have to put, hold my hand in front of it 
but don't touch it, right? But I've touched it a million times. I'm not, I'm not the only one. You, you can see it says no touch, but the no touch is rubbed off already because people always touch it, right? Everybody knows rationally, they know I shouldn't touch it because everybody reads it and they know it. They still touch it many times. Why? Because it's designed badly. It gives you a wrong message. It is designed so you feel inclined to touch it. Why? Well, you could say, this is a long, long and interesting discussion. Well, in a short way, you would say, well, it, you have this round thing and it, it kind of comes out. It just looks like a push button. It looks like a button I need to push. And then I feel if I push it after that, the door will open or will be unlocked. But it's not meant to be like that. It's just, now this is something that for sure an engineer has done. And they thought, well, cool, I have this nice aluminum box. I put a nice black square on it. And wow, doesn't the, 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 the LED ring look great? And yeah, but it just says the wrong thing. It gives you the wrong message. It has the wrong meaning. This is why it's a good example for terrible design, really bad design. People always understand it wrong. So I think that's, that's a great thing for indication of function. And it also has some indication of character on it because it says I'm stupid because I'm rubbed off where it says no touch. Okay. So interesting example. I like it a lot. Uh, this is a completely different example, but it's also, there's a lot of, uh, of information of symbolic meaning in there. This is a Zippo uh, lighter, and I guess all of you know exactly what it does, and I guess all, most of you have already used one. Uh, so you, it, it's a gasoline lighter. You open, you open up this the top, and then you, with your thumb, you would, you would rotate that little Flintstone thing, and it will make the light but there's so much information in just this on the outside already just to give you a few examples um, now indication of function is it actually tells you clearly how to open it uh, and you what you can actually see is you can, you can see um, this uh, little hinge here now you can see well you could say well it's a hinge because it's sheet metal yeah right it's uh, it is made like this because it's feasible technically but it tells you something right you never try to open it the wrong way around because you can see it so it tells you something um, also what is what is highly attractive is that it's not a symmetrical cover well you might say well it doesn't need to be symmetrical because the top bit of the lighter is shorter but it tells you something you hold it round the right way round you know where the base is you know where the top is right apart from that this specific one, indication of character, really worn down, right? So you can see, yeah, it's old, has been used a lot. So obviously, you could say, well, it must be working great. If somebody used it that long, right, then it must, that, that means that the owner really enjoys using it. So that some, says something about the value, the perceived value of that. Another thing which I really like is, uh, how do you open that? right so typically if you've never used it you would kind of awkwardly pick up the top from the bottom like that no that's not how people open it you can open it like that and there's nothing wrong with it but if you own it if you've owned it for a long time how do you open it and i guess you've seen that in movies you open it by uh, holding it in only one hand and then flicking it open with a thumb and you can see that why can you see that you can see that because on the top of the lid uh, all the silver or chrome or nickel plating, whatever that is, is rubbed off. So you can really see on this one how it is handled, right? You can see how you hold it in your hand because everywhere where it's, where it's touched by the hand, the, uh, the plating is gone. So on the bottom side, it's on the left and right side because you hold it in your hand, your fingers go. This is obviously a right-handed owner. And then on the top, it's only it's only worn off at the top. So it's not only rubbing. It's not. It didn't lose its coating by being carried around in a pocket, but by touching human skin, it's because the moisture, the sweat, is 
is acidious, so it it obviously uh, helped taking off the plating in some areas quicker than in others. So this tells us how to open it. Yeah, you you kind of you uh, press your thumb against the top corner and then you flick up your thumb and it will open the lid. That's totally great. And there's a lot more. So uh, basically, that that is a, something you need to learn. You it's it's not 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 an approach you just you hear this lecture and you will will be uh, people who will be using all of that knowledge uh, actively this is something you have to practice and um, the current design project uh, that that we started about vehicles uh, all these aspects are highly important but then i can't give you clear instructions exactly on how to use it and you kind of really this is a mindset you have to start these discussions and best thing would be is really to discuss to 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 sit together uh probably using a zoom meeting or something and then discuss stuff now it's a lot easier to discuss objects that are there already uh, it is extremely difficult to run this discussion and then uh as a result of that uh have ideas for your design i mean i guess some people can do it like that when they're really seasoned designers but for you i would just uh i would uh advise you look at um look at other examples that do similar things so in your case look at other vehicles that have a similar purpose and just discuss why they're designed in a way and that goes to for practical features for function indicators but also for non practicals like uh well, with these vehicles, it's not so clear, right? Uh, but but maybe the uh, the rickshaw is a great example. Now, why are all these ornaments there, right? Um, do they have a practical function, or are they only ornaments? And and what are they supposed to express? What are they supposed to mean? With the Thai rickshaw, a lot of that is specifically Thai. But I took great care that both of the teams have equal amounts of Thai people. But these Thai people might not be very sensitive to to, to Thai culture, right? I guess. You aren't because you're engineers. Anyhow, this is something you uh, should enjoy uh, thinking about and dealing with more. And that's it for today.